All right. That always gets me fired up when I see that. I'm so excited to be here this morning. Thanks, everybody, for being here. As we're ending our town hall series, as we're trying to do something different and uh, actually come out and talk to everybody in districts, and we decided to do a little business town hall, and I'm very excited to have uh, Aisha Driggers from our Office of Business Opportunity joining me and Ryan Coleman for our Economic Development Department here today um, as we're trying to do something different as we talked about, engaging, um, getting into the community and talking about what's happening in, in Columbia. Um, as you know, we've been really focused on, on open Columbia as we talked about, which is you know not only open for business, but for ideas, innovation, engagement. Uh, and I think over the last 18, 19 months, we've seen a lot more engagement, people fully uh, involved. But uh, as, as we're coming into this, as we all talked about, you know, the important piece of the puzzle is, is business. And you can't have a strong neighborhood without a strong business community. You can't have a strong business community without a strong neighborhood. So we have to have that balance. Um, but also wanted to take a time to acknowledge all of our city leaders that are here today. If y'all could all stand up, uh, you're such a, a big key part. We would not be able to get here if it wasn't for our city <laughs> leaders and staff. You know, um, as, as we talk about what Ms. Wilson and her team, we have ACM, Simons here, ACM, Sheely, uh, who else is here? We got uh, Shannon and her team from procurement here. Krista. Yeah, Krista and Missy. Oh, there they are. They're tucked away in the middle of planning and budgeting. Uh, Spencer Green uh, working on our real estate. Greg Williams, Gracie Salters. And then, of course, our police department. Uh, I would be remiss if we don't give these guys a hand as well for being here. Thank you all so much for what you do. But, you know, we wanted to start discussing citywide initiatives, then into economic development, business opportunities team here, both to give you all some updates on what's going on. And then we'll open up the question. I'm going to try to make this kind of quick and simple. There's so much information. Um, you know, but for the next three hours, just sit back and relax. It, it'll be okay. We'll get through it together. Um, but seriously, we're just so excited that, you know, we're continuing to adapt the One Columbia theme that Mayor Benjamin put together because truly for us to be the strong city that we are, we have to be one. Um, and working with every business, every public service, neighborhood, district, law enforcement, our firefighters, our officers, government officials, schools, churches, and citizens, together we make up the puzzle and everybody's a piece of that puzzle. And so when we come together, we make multiple connections. And so we're gonna to continue to focus on that theme of, of being part of the puzzle. Uh, you can't mention you know, one part of the city without one, another part of the city as we talk about. You know, it's not just neighborhoods and businesses, it's individuals and, and a town full of talent like we are it's just amazing of all the pieces and I'm so excited that we're able to start telling people about it that video we share all the time uh, thank you experience Columbia for what y'all do and putting it out there because we're part of telling our story and our story is so important because when we tell people about Columbia and we've been on the road in Charleston we've been to Atlanta we've been to Greenville Charlotte and we're gonna to continue to move around the Southeast and other places to attract people here. But telling our story, people are amazed at what we have in Columbia. They realize that we're just not a college town, that we are the capital city of South Carolina. So obviously it takes a United, United team to, to make these kind of things happen. Um, and our job at the city of Columbia is to ensure the groundwork and the growth for development in our community is moving forward partnerships, collaboration. If you look at our competitive reports, our biggest negative for so long was the collaboration piece. And now that's changing, we're collaborating. We're collaborating with our neighbor governments, our, our, our partnerships in town, if it's our hospitality districts, our business community working hand in hand, building back up our neighborhood infrastructure, 
as we prepare to continue to grow downtown. You know, we lost 9% of our population over the last decade. So rebuilding that one house at a time, creating more opportunities to live downtown and take part. Listening to our, our young folks who are, who are moving here or are here in college who want to stay in Columbia, but telling us why they're not and why it's important that we invest in downtown living and amenities and our greenways and making the connectivity, thinking about future, more walkability, more bike paths, investing in our, our, our community, both from everything from planting trees to renewable energy, trying different things. So we're gonna cover a snapshot of Columbia today. There, you, when you walked in, it was scrolling on the screens. There must have been 150, 200 different things going on. Obviously, we can't cover all of it, but just so you know that we're spending millions of dollars, lots of staff hours to improve the quality of life of Columbia. Our focus has been invest in Columbia. That means into our staff, into technology, into training, equipment, but amenities, into our parks, into our greenways, into our downtown. And as we continue to grow, take advantage, get away from being a city full of parking lots and a city full of people walking around, spending money, owning businesses, following their dreams right here in Columbia, South Carolina. So when we look at the city's work, you see multiple pieces of the puzzle and the puzzles are theme because everybody plays that part. So let's talk about public service um, first, um, obviously, Public Works is, <laughs> is working non, non, non-stop, but you think about it, we got 17 different departments that are serving you as a community, and it's everything from 911, animal services, billing department, planning and zoning, parking, it goes on and on, police, fire, everybody working hand, forestry, every piece plays a role and affects one of the others. So bringing everybody together and working and communicating is so important. You know, we, we run the largest municipal water system. Why is that important? That's our future. That's economic development and that's our future as citizens and the security for something is so important, water. Upgrading meters, 150,000 meters we upgraded. And why is that important? Because it allows us to share information with you, the customer, in minutes, not hours. Investing in that lets us know if there are leaks going on. It allows us to, to monitor, especially when things are going on, and directly communicate with you, the homeowner or business owner or, or landlord, whichever you are. Investing in our, our call times. We had, you know, a tremendous amount of complaints about call times because for we are averaging 1500 calls a day so sitting down with the staff and listening to their their input changing the structure so taking people who are working nights and weekends and putting them into nine to five where the volume of our call was and then using technology answering services to deal with others so that we're getting right into the meat of the trouble calls and how important it is but reorganizing, that's communication. That's us working across departments together, but listening to the folks who are on the front line. You know, obviously a large part of our responsibility is public safety, as you know, police. Uh, we invested heavily in our police department, um, making sure that they have a step up program. You know, giving them the tools and the technology, take home cars, shot spotter, doing all the things that we can from a training but also investing in them with mental health clinicians, making sure that we have things there to help them do their job because our guys work a tremendous amount of time and effort and being out with them and seeing what they do on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis, I think would shock most of you how much these guys, and they do it with compassion and care. And having that with the call volumes that they have and, and the things that they deal with on a day-to-day -day is amazing. Uh, I think we need to give them another round of applause. <laughs> but investing in, in Operation Hope and giving them the tools and, 
and the resources with having yellow shirts help supplement, uh, private security help supplement, continuing to invest and find ways to help them do their job. Red light cameras that we're going after at the state house. Why is that important? Technology today could help prevent a lot of accidents, speeding in school zones and work zones where you're not having to take an officer away from what he needs to be doing, which is taking care of each of our businesses and our residents. Um, and having that, that ability to do that and the flexibility is gonna be so important. But the police department is not just in its public safety role is also the code enforcement. Being out there and doing the inspections, the cleanups, the, the demolitions of substandard structures, being there to make sure that, that we're living up to the codes that are a place that we're not affecting other people's quality of life, but making sure that things are safe for everybody. We funded the Office of Violent Crime this year, fully funded and staffed and the efforts around because we needed that quarterback. We needed somebody to come in and help us organize all the great efforts out there to make sure that we're having the biggest impact. Violent crime is the biggest deterrent in our community. Um, gun violence up, domestic violence up, and that's not who we are as a community. So making sure that we have somebody who's focused on that, who's making sure that they're able to take the best of the programs out there and work together in partnership, in collaboration to reduce those numbers. The one thing we don't wanna see is an increase in violent crime. We had domestic violence walk, probably the biggest crowd I've ever seen out there. And some of the emotional stories that we heard and the impact and people at every level, but knowing a community is here to support them and that we're making efforts to try to reduce that was a calming effect, but we also learned things there. Now, the, the fact that we need to focus on the cyber side, something we hadn't thought about and really didn't think about, but the, these stalkers or former things being able to get into people's Alexas and their phones and hearing what's going on in their house and keeping them vulnerable. We need to do everything we can take advantage of all the technology and everything that's out there to make sure that we're reducing um, violent crime in our community. And we're gonna to continue to improve and, and do everything we can to prevent. Obviously fire, another public safety role. We inspect every business for safety. You know, we, we've invested in our fire department with a step up program, got second set of gear, building a new firehouse, investing in the fire houses we have, but equipment as well making sure that we're taking care of those who are taking care of us, but making sure they're safe and we're safe. Fire marshals doing hundreds of inspections, but even doing good things in our communities, like giving over 250 smoke alarms and installing those in, in people's houses who didn't have it to make sure that they're safe, that we don't end up with a fire for the wrong reason. But taking fire prevention week and actually going out into the neighborhoods and talking to people, you know, little things like remembering to turn off your iron, blow out candles, do the things that are important, but sometimes we need a reminder of to make sure that we're keeping our community safe one house at a time. Obviously, homelessness on everybody's mind, it affects every uh, part of our community. It affects the unsheltered. It affects our residents. It affects our businesses. So opening up our rapid shelter program, and where's Ms. Shepard? I know I saw her. Ms. Kamisha is here, our director. We couldn't do it without her and her team. The time and efforts of what they're doing to help us deal with, with the unsheltered, making sure that we're getting them the services. And I'm proud to say with the Rapid Shelter Program, the 50 pallet homes, we've been able to get 32 people into permanent housing with wraparound services. It takes time and effort to do that, but doing it one step at a time. And obviously for us, that's just the beginning. We're focused on a one-stop shop. We wanna have a single point where all the services are included. So we're talking about everything from DMV to DMH, to urgent care, to physical therapy, to clinicians, to classrooms, having everything in one place because right now services are fractured. So we're losing people all over our community. It's not helping those unsheltered. We gotta change the way we're doing it. We're spending $40 million a year in 103 different service providers providing service, 
and our numbers are increasing. We're seeing more people who are camping out and keeping themselves distance. They're not getting service. They're being enabled to stay, and that's not healthy. It's not healthy for the unsheltered community. It's not healthy for our business community. It's not healthy for our residents. We have to change, and we're going to try it, something different, and we're going to need everyone's support as we continue to do that. Obviously, we've been super focused on highlighting, utilizing, and expanding the city's access to our rivers. The William Street Extension Project is moving forward. We have 30% construction documents. Uh, I worked out an agreement with the Ginyard family to make all that happen and open up that part for development, but future access to the river so that we have more downtown access. Partnership with Dominion Energy to allow us to lease over 200 acres to connect between here and I-20 to open it up, being able to partner with Irmo Recreation Commission, the Mungo Foundation, and others who have now gathered right away from the dam all the way down. And as Carolina Crossroads finishes, you'll be able to leave downtown on a bike, on your two feet, never have to deal with traffic and go all the way to the dam and back. And if we can continue with our program, get the overpass, into Elmwood Park and connect a whole nother area. So if you happen to slip on a rock, you can walk yourself to Richland Memorial and get stitched up and then stop back at Warmouth and have, have, have lunch. There'll be so many different things you'll be able to do with the connectivity. And it's probably in the top five requests of our community is to finish the greenways, get the connectivity, the walkability, in all of these steps, and we're very thankful for the partnerships, including the Boyd Foundation, who's investing millions of dollars in our community, especially into our outdoors and our river. This opens up our riverfront, and it's bringing other partners to the table. We've already heard from other property owners who now want to grant us access and give us ability to open up not only our, our, our Saluda and our Congaree side, but the broad side, where it's very limited to public access, and open up that beautiful stretch which will also help some of our neighborhoods who are on that side of the river in, in probably some challenge areas who don't have access to the river today, but opening it up for every neighborhood and every citizen. Obviously, we're so proud of, of Public Works and others for all the, the many initiatives that they've launched, but I think one of the greatest things for people to understand is that that Columbia was selected to lead cities. We're the only city in South Carolina who's gold lead certified, which is incredible. So there are only 16 cities across the country this year that achieved this status. And it makes me now want to get to platinum. Why is it important? That's what today's business community and consumers are looking for. They're looking for cities to invest and plant that only you not only have a quality of life, but are thinking about the future thinking about how we adapt to deal with climate change. And that could be as simple as, as we start repaving roads, seal coating those with reflective white paint so that we're reducing our, our heat index. You know, we're 18 and a half degrees higher in the, according to our heat study. Well, if we can reduce that with investing in trees, doing white roofs, doing white roads, all these little pieces that we can do to make a difference and reduce that, helps not only our climate, but it helps out with power bills. It helps out with, with people's health initiatives. It's part of a bigger picture. And doing that and partnering today with different entities, we're getting ready to do a pilot program with the Reflective Roads, which I think will be a, an incredible program to see and measure. How much does it reduce? And as we plan for the future to repave in our roads and fixing our sidewalks and building buildings, how do we keep making sure that we put that incentive in there to help reduce that heat wave and, and make us uh, you know, relatively cool instead of uh, famously hot, as I like to say. But also, working with our state partners and our federal partners, we've been talking about the modernization of railroads since 1905 in this town, and for us to get elevated uh, crossings on assembly and get rid of 15 crossings across the city, opening up a part of our community that has been challenged because of the rail coming in. Rail is very important to our state. Rail's increased by 47%, and a lot of that is the inlet port and the port 
and all the automotive that is, is happening in our community and things are being transported more on rail right now than they are on our highway, which is a good thing for traffic, but is a bad thing for a city that has 60 rail crossings. And since none of those businesses are really located here, we're just a pass through. So getting the state legislator to support us with $40 million, working with the federal government on infrastructure, mega grants, meeting with the DOT uh, department, working with the White House, and very thankful that we have a former mayor in the White House because it helps going after those projects so that not only can we realign those rails, but we also have the ability to go after the quiet zones, which means upgrading all the safety in our neighborhoods so that we can have trains come through without honking their horns. Making sure that, that with the safety uh, improvements with gates, lights, traffic, medians, all the things that we need to slow down traffic and pedestrian and make it safer, we're focused on that. And that's 14 uh, grade crossings, roughly about $5 million. And then obviously our next piece is neighborhoods and communities, continuing to invest in our parks, uh, in Finley Park, Hyatt Park, our tennis center, Southeastern Park, Mays Park. We just finished uh, working on Hampton Park, you know, putting more equipment in there, a new building, equipping them with, with Wi-Fi, making them back to being the center of our, of our neighborhoods, investing in the maintenance and having park rangers, having ownership in all our parks. A lot of people say, well, how are you going to keep the crown jewel nice? You know, and I said, well, we failed the first time. We didn't invest in maintenance like we should have. And that's on us. We recognize that. But now we're going to have ownership there, having maintenance crews there, having park rangers there, and activation with all the outdoor activities that will be going on in Finley Park keeps it healthy. And if you look at cities that have beautiful center parks and invested in their parks heavily, they're full of families. They're not filled with crime. They're not filled with elements that you don't want there. They're filled with families because they're activated. And that's our approach and so excited about that. Obviously, we've invested heavily by putting $100,000 worth of computers in our park, bringing access to folks who may not have that at home, but helping with our, our youth as well. We did, I think, over 15, 1,400 youth this summer that we had in camps. We have over 450 seniors that we're, we're working with who are doing everything from exercising to bingo, but our parks are become the center. We opened up a community resource center uh, an opportunity that came out of a, a neighborhood meeting where we had folks who wanted kind of an incubator space either for their nonprofit or their small business. So we took advantage of a, a bad situation. We had a flood in the library. We took that and refocused that library and now it's filled with cubicles. It has meeting rooms. It has technology and Wi-Fi and printers so people can come up and actually chase their dream and we brought it to their community where they can be close to home and they have the ability to, to work at their hours and follow their dreams, but also come up with programs to improve the quality of life in their community. And it's just one piece. Obviously, we continue to invest as we talk about neighborhoods, communities, but in our city workforce. Market salary adjustments for all employees. Not only was it police and fire, but all our employees got market salary adjustments. We, we bring in our employees up, but that's not where we want to stop. We want to continue to work by investing in training programs, technology, things to allow them, to allow them to share with us their ideas. We did about eight months ago, we had an opportunity to go meet with employees, mainly our folks who are out in the field every day, and talk to them. And what I learned from them is some of the processes and procedures we have were actually keeping us from doing our job. So switching that, learning from our employees, but having that engagement, we're getting ready to do that again because every time we go and sit down with our employees, we're learning more. We can't be everywhere and we can't do ever, but if we can empower, give them the technology, the autonomy to do their job, the training, they have, they're their first touch with our communities. It's about community service. It's about customer service. That's who we are. We're in the customer service business. We don't provide just services. We provide customer service. 
So continuing to invest in, in, in that, obviously consolidating our office is our big focus. We're looking to consolidate our employees in, in hubs so that the interaction can be much stronger, that we can get things done in a more efficient and effective manner because we're communicating in close proximity that we're floors away, not blocks away. Also with that, it allows us to open up key pieces of property across our community. And I think that's so important that we're, we're selling property to get back to create tax base. If it's the corner of Bull and Taylor, if it's Laurel and Main, if it's Washington Square, whatever it is, it's gonna allow us to get more people downtown, more businesses, more opportunity. It helps us deal with the gaps in affordable and workforce housing as we continue to look at that because we have to find a way to continue growing. We need 16,000 units over the next decade. The housing authorities playing their part, we're playing our part, but part of our job and these guys' job is to help us bring these, these development teams to our community. But we don't just want development, we want good quality development and good management. So actually going to communities where they've done projects and see them and look at them to understand how do they manage it. And I don't wanna see something that's just a year old, I wanna see something that's 20 years old. How do you do it over a period of time? And we've had that, we've had that experience uh, and met some folks where I saw some 30 year old projects that look better than five year old projects because of their continued investment in management and how they build it up. And this is across the spectrum from 30% medium income to, to voucher eight, uh, Section 8 housing all mixed in with each other and and it works the model works and people have the opportunity then to, to eventually get to home ownership when they're ready which is so important so economic development um, I'm just so excited uh, we, we have such a great team put together Ryan and his team working with those small businesses, helping us recruit those restaurants and retail, which is our focus now, back office, how we're investing in creating partnerships to go after everything from cybersecurity to different sales companies who wanna live in an urban environment, who want to be, we urban development, that's our focus, that's who we are. We're not a manufacturing city. We're an urban development city, and so getting our focus, making sure those all those storefronts are, are filled, but. You know, look, 600 million in development over the last 12 months, not a bad number. And I, think, I see the projection for the next 12 months probably closer to a billion with what we see going on. And let alone when we forecast out another two years, you add Scout and everything that's coming with it, we're, we're really huge investment. And that investment is not only staying here, it's growing here and it's reinvesting in our community. They're part of it and so excited about it. Obviously our hospitality and business districts growing and advancing Main Street, Five Points, the Vista, North Main, and North Main coming together and creating their own district, but spreading it out by, by different areas where they can focus on their team members, focused on building one block at a time. I think we had so far close to a thousand new business applications. I think over the last 18 months, close to 1,300 new businesses, not renewal, new businesses, small, medium, and large, all growing here, which tells me we're doing the right thing, that the business-friendly initiatives and, and our focus on encouraging people to follow their dreams is working. So we gotta continue to do that, streamlining our license process and continuing to to invest in the technologies to make it easier, but also in, in working with our staffs to make sure they have the ability to make decisions, giving empowerment to our staff to do things at the staff level, not everything going to committee, cutting down time. Time is money when you're trying to grow a business and it affects a small business more than anybody else. So anything we can do to reduce the time, make it easier for those businesses to grow, the more businesses are come. And I'm so excited to, to, you know, as we've gone to Charleston and others, listening to these folks who are now looking at Columbia. We just had a group in from Florida who runs an incredible uh, restaurant group looking and serious about Columbia. Big step for them, obviously, to, to come to Columbia when they have nothing else in South Carolina. 
but what they saw and what they, they felt when they were here, it's so positive. There's so much upbeat. People are now discovering what they skipped over, that we're not only the capital city, but we're a city filled with talent and incredible businesses and, and people and quality of life, and that's what they're looking for today. So obviously, you know, we're gonna continue to take feedback from everybody and be part of that. Um, our economic development update, uh, I think I'm gonna try to throw this to, let's start with Ryan and then come back to Aisha to kind of give us some big picture and short term and a little yes, bit sir. where we're headed. Sure, um, thank you for the introduction, Mayor, and thank you uh, everyone who's come out this morning and for taking time out of your busy day uh, to come and learn about what's been going on at the city and our thoughts and our, our vision you know, where we see things headed over the next uh, year, two years, three years. It really is an exciting time in the city of Columbia and a really exciting time to be doing economic development because Columbia's kind of got a, got a vibe now, like things are happening, it's, it's, there's energy. Um, people are looking at Columbia from the outside in and say, hey, there's something going on there and I feel like I wanna be a part of that, you know, and we're hearing that from the other cities across the southeast, so um, we're just we're just really excited to be a part of that action. Um, I really want to take a moment to kind of introduce uh, my teammates who are here in attendance. Um, we've got some new additions uh, to the team who've really helped bring some energy into what we're doing in economic development. Because at the end of the day, we are really focused on sales and we're focused on customer service. So we want to to sell the city to those outside businesses or those businesses that are here currently and that are looking to expand. But once we get them here, we have to make sure that we prioritize um, that they're being assisted and they have fast friendly support. And that's something that's been a huge priority um, for city council over the past few years. And what you're seeing right now is a result of that prioritization. Uh, so of course you've got myself, I've been with the city for about 17 years now. Um, Greg Williams, who's here, he's our uh, project. Yeah, feel free to stand up, sure. Um, <laughs> Greg Williams is our, our project manager uh, slash business liaison. So as we have people that come in and start to work through the approval process, he's really hands-on with those projects and helps those people get from permitting to certificate of occupancy. And he does a tremendous job with that. Uh, one of our uh, mo most recent additions, Miss Grace Salter. <laughs> Uh, she has uh, come to us by way of uh, USC, so she's had done some previous work in the property sector, has done a lot of work with veterans programs, and we're really excited to have her uh, doing our business recruitment management. It really is a relationship business at the end of the day, um, and if any of y'all ever get the chance to interact with, interact with her, she's just super positive all the time. Um, and then... <laughs> And then Mr. Spencer Green, um, he's uh, been a tremendous asset to our team as well. He's been here probably about four months and he's helping us a lot with the commercial real estate items that the mayor mentioned earlier. He's got a tremendous background in the sector, has worked with large national firms previously and really brings that private sector expertise that, that we need as we look to start to unwind ourselves from some properties. So as the mayor mentioned, the, the renewed focus really is on marketing Columbia externally, and it's, it's, it's been a lot easier to do the past few years. We've had so many new ribbon cuttings and announcements, and we've got multifamily opening across the city. We've got our universities that are hitting record enrollment numbers. We're a very affordable community to live in. You can still get a home on a nice piece of property for under $250,000 here. Um, and so uh, it, it's a great time for us as we're working on our pitch book and we're going out to these other cities to, to solicit and say, hey, there's something going on here. We're growing. We're going to be the next best thing. And you absolutely need to get here and be a part of that. Um, something that we, we always kind of have to work around has been our commercial development program. And um, that's something that the mayor and council have been a champion for uh, the past few years. And we we understand the challenges to doing business here and that our property taxes you know kind of put a limiting factor on the growth here and so it, it's been really exciting to see the success that we've seen off this program in 2014 to 2016 it was a student housing incentive we got 
six large projects off of that. Uh, 2019 through the end of last year, we had our most recent uh, program. We had several significant projects, Ben Arnold's Vista project, Bennett at Bull Street, um, and that's been incredibly successful for helping us attract uh, mixed use and multifamily apartments. And now kind of working with the county to figure out, well, where do we go from here? Because we know interest rates out there are high. It's really challenging, and we need to do what we can do as a city county region um, to help make these deals work at the end of the day. I, I gotta add to Ryan talked about the ribbon cuttings. I mean, it's close to like 70 rib, ribbon cuttings, but what I think so important about it is the last several months, almost every ribbon cutting we've had are women-owned businesses. And I love that. I mean, because it's a really a, a reflection on our community and who we are, but it also is a reflection on our Office of Business Opportunity and what they're doing and helping people follow their dreams and some of these businesses have been small some of them are great some of them are first time bricks and mortars some of them have morphed out of soda city and some of these other great things that are going in our community but they're not stopping i'm going to another one today uh, <laughs> and, and another women-owned business is bringing a different concept here and just but why it's exciting is because this is what people are looking at they're looking at our community and the diversity of it. We have a large international community here. We have businesses growing left and right in every district, and we're gonna to continue to grow that one piece at a time and take advantage. Y'all, we get 16 million visitors here. 16 million. That's almost as equal to what Charleston is, and put it in perspective, Myrtle Beach gets 22. I think that says a lot. Our challenge is getting those overnight stays, and so the more things that we have going on, opening up the river, taking advantage and getting, growing our arts community, growing our performing arts, growing, getting, you know, more concerts here. You know, there's no reason that the Colonial Center should have dark lights any day of the week. If they're not playing basketball, we ought to be having something going on in there. People come here and they do geographically where we're located is an advantage because in 20 minutes you can be in five counties. So the drive time for an hour for somebody to come to a show is um, not many cities that have three rivers and three major highways around it. We are close. We got to start taking advantage of, of our geographic uh, location and continuing, as, as Ryan mentioned, the external marketing, telling people our story, telling them about our individual. Our strength is our people. You can go on, knock on every door in every neighborhood, and every door you'll find a different story. I mean, we got award-winning authors, artists, inventors. There are people here that hold so many patents that you don't even know. They're just, they're just going through life, enjoying every beautiful part of our city, but we need to celebrate that and share that with people because that's our strength. Our people are our strength. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I do think we're the number one city in South Carolina. We're going to get there, but we're working on it. Um, uh, do you want me to hit on any of these? We've had some really significant projects uh, the, the past year and a half, and it has been tremendous to go for a situation where we walked out of COVID, and you would go down to five points, and half of those businesses were empty. And now here we are, and you can't find a vacancy in Columbia almost. It's getting tougher and tougher for us to find places to locate people actually. So um, Beer, Beer Keller was a tremendous one that was up on the previous list. I got a uh, video from the owner this weekend, you know, obviously a big weekend in Columbia. It was shoulder to shoulder at the Canal Side Esplanade this weekend. His text to me, we have got to figure out what to do on our riverfront sooner rather than later because we have a ton of people who are coming in for this. Uh, projects like EPC Executive Personal Computers, they bought the former Walmart on Bush River Road. They've invested $10 million and have created 150 new jobs out there, just got their certificate of occupancy. Uh, receivable Solutions, a new office tenant that's moving into 1441 Main Street downtown. Um, and seeing what's happening on the street, on Main Street, MOA, Columbia, you know, a, a concept from local restaurateur Sean Kim you know, we're at the point to where we're seeing the, the banks move off of Main Street and the restaurants and retailers come back. And that's what we want. We want that walkable, pedestrian-friendly city. And it, it's awesome to see that that happening right now. 
uh, major projects that are in development currently, you know, obviously Peak Drift has opened their production side and they've got about 40,000 square feet of space that they're still working on for restaurant entertainment venue. Uh, Jim Moore Cadillac, that, that project is basically ready to go and we expect them to begin moving dirt there. That's 250 luxury apartments right there on a marquee site that we've all had our eye on for many, many years here in Columbia. Uh, I mentioned Ben Arnold's project, the Vista Depot. I mean, there is a point, you know, in the next couple of years where you will be able to walk out the back of the convention center to a 300 room full service hotel and apartments and structured parking. And, you know, the list goes on, the Moxie Hotel project that's underway. I mean, it's just really tremendous, all of these things that are happening currently. And success breeds more success. So the more that we can lean into these things, the more that we can expose people from the outside in, here's what's happening here, the more people want to come and be a part of it. Well, I think what'll be exciting is all the other announcements that we know are coming that we can't talk about yet that I think people will be really excited about. And then of course, when Scout Motors opens up, it's actually gonna really change. And what was exciting for me is, is we were going through that process with VW as they were coming down to narrowing us down to another city had an opportunity to talk to the mayor of Chattanooga and he said, so tell me, you know, how is VW as a community partner? And he said, they're invested in our community in every aspect, everything from cultural to social to our schools. They're, they're living downtown, they're part of our community. And he said, if you look at their history, wherever they've built a plant, they've never closed it. And so when you hear things like that from another city, you go, this is gonna be really exciting. And how many more opportunities does this open up for us? I don't think we know all the opportunities that are gonna come out of, of this opening up, especially since we're only talking about phase one right now. We haven't even begun to talk about phase two, which they're committed to. I think also what's very exciting about that is the VW board member who this is kind of his main project he started off his automotive career as being part of right here in South Carolina. He came from Germany to open up the BMW plant in Greenville. So I know what they did there and I'm really excited about what they're gonna do here. But with that, I'm gonna kick it to Miss Driggers who is in, can we say, we're not a year yet, are we? Uh, Almost? Yeah, next, next month will be a year. Next month, she will celebrate her year anniversary as our director. <laughs> and I say that because when she was put into interim director and we made the decision to make her the director, it was incredible. And the resounding feedback that we got from the community of what Aisha and her team does, it's incredible. Uh, I couldn't be happier to have somebody like herself in that position being the front line for the city. She reflects everything that's great about our community and her team does an incredible job. And if you haven't had an opportunity to interact with her and her team, or you know somebody who wants to start a business and wants to know what's out there and offer, please send them to our OBO office because they're gonna leave there happier than they went in, I guarantee it. But with that, I'm gonna let you kick it off. I'm always flattered when the mayor does my introduction because you do <laughs> such a great job, I appreciate it. So um, thank you for the invitation. I love getting to come talk to the community about what we have going on in OBO. And of course we can't do it without our amazing team. I only have two of them here today. Everyone else is back at the office working, but one is Kalina Ginyard, if you'll stand up. She's responsible for our workshops and technical assistance. <laughs> yes, and Kalina is a recent promotion too. So she took on some of the functions I was doing previously and she's just doing an amazing job. So we appreciate her and all her hard work. And then one of our most popular staff members, Brett Whiting, <laughs> is back there. Brett, please stand. The money man. Yeah, exactly. So Brett is our loan officer. So most people want to come to our office and talk to Brett. But I really can say that what we do in our office is not possible without an amazing team. And I appreciate them so much. And we're also in a unique position because we work with a lot of our city departments. And what we do to provide opportunities to our business community is um, because of the great relationships that we have with Columbia Water, Parks and Rec, uh, planning, all of the different departments that are represented at the city. So we appreciate that continued relationship. 
And absolutely. <laughs> and I'm going to touch on procurement very closely because we work with them often. And they're in the three uh, staff members are here from procurement. Shannon Luzeski, the director, Nadia Johnson, and Trent Watford also are here. <laughs> So I am going to touch with them. Oftentimes in our contractor and supplier diversity program, we're looking for opportunities for our vendors and suppliers to reflect the diversity of our city. So the mission of our office is to support those initiatives that assist small minority women and veteran owned businesses. And we do that very closely with our procurement department. So um, here's just a picture of some of our workshops and events that we have held throughout the year. We do that probably a workshop, at least two a month, if not more than that. We're always looking for an opportunity to get out into the community and share information about different topics that are of interest to them, whether that be financial statements, making sure they understand their profit and loss statements, business planning. Uh, we did one recently about bridging the generational gap because in the workforce, we have different generations working together. And so that's a per important um, to understand what that means in the workforce. So we continue to do workshops and events, um, whether it be Women's Empowerment, Black Expo. We do our signature Small Business Week event every May um, each year. So we're looking forward to that next year as well. Next, we have our yeah, commercial retention and redevelopment program. So that was formerly our facade program. And that's where we can make interior and exterior improvements to a business. We've been in Five Points a couple of years. We are looking for opportunities to expand out into other areas throughout the city. And really it's so that we can address some, maybe some of the blight that a business may be experiencing. Um, and as you know, if you wanna have an attractive community, you need to make sure that it's somewhere that someone feels welcome and they, they want to um, participate in um, supporting those businesses. So our CRR program is a great program. I know Ryan gets a lot of interest for businesses that are interested in locating in the city if there are any fun, funds available. So CRR it gives us the ability to do that. Also our commercial revolving loan pro program is also a program that's available to businesses that are located within the city of Columbia. It's our loan program. It's very, like I said, it's very popular. And so if anyone is interested in that, I encourage you to stop by our booth and get information so that we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to see how we can provide assistance to you. I will also say our commercial revolving loan um, program requires participation from a private lender, or maybe it's the, per the business's own funding. So it allows us to leverage those dollars so that they can go further in the community. And there are some exciting new businesses that are coming that are participating in that loan program. So we're happy that we have the opportunity to utilize those funds. And it's a revolving loan fund. So as those funds are paid back, we can reinvest them back into the community. We also have our Tom's Creek Family Farms mobile market. I will say um, the mayor always talks about us being open to new ideas. And I think the mobile market um, is a great innovative way for us to address some of the food disparities that exist in some of our communities. Um, specifically 29203 and 29204 will be our initial target. There's definitely opportunities for us to expand on that but they're gonna actually go into some of our parks and set up, it's a trailer, but on the inside, it looks like a grocery store. So there's fresh fruits and vegetables. They'll have produce, um, meat, fresh bread. It's gonna be a really great opportunity to meet the needs of the community. They'll be able to accept SNAP benefits and of course, cash cards. And so it's an exciting opportunity for us to provide that, the needed um, food resources to those communities. Also, Tom's Creek, if you don't know, they just opened a grocery store, the Farmer's Market Exchange on Lady Street. So that is the same vendor that is doing our mobile market. They also have a farm in Hopkins. So it's just a great opportunity for us to support a small business while also meeting the needs of our community. So we're really excited about that. They hope to launch the um, mobile market in January after they upset the trailer. And then we have Food Truck Fridays. That's been an exciting initiative that our city is, our, our office is responsible for. We've been able to support over 30 food trucks and give them an opportunity to come. Right now we're at REI, if you're familiar right there, besides Starbucks, um, or Colonial and Bull Street. We're out there every Friday from 11 to three o'clock, providing opportunities for those food trucks to provide their cuisine. And it's an array of cuisine. So, uh, Latin cuisine, we've had uh, Filipino, 
uh, soul food is always very popular in that area. So um, just, I would encourage anyone who is not familiar with the different activities that come out of our office to follow our um, newsletter. You can register for that on our website at ovo.columbiasc.gov and we share information about different events that are coming out of our office, initiatives, funding opportunities, which is always really important, and just different topics that are, are of interest to our small business community. And her, their team continues to reach out. As she talked about it, it, making sure people understand their financial statements, making sure that they're prepared to go after if it's SBA loan, commercial loans, being able to work, but also making sure you're connected with the right folks, accounting, understanding the process of what it takes to start a business, but also to take advantage of what's out there for you if it's tax incentives, explaining the grease trap program if you're getting into a restaurant, you know, looking at, you know, we've taken away sewer expansion fees from, from small um, retail outlets that change into restaurants. Understanding the system, because starting a business can be complicated. So when you have the resources that we have at OVO, uh, it makes it so much smoother and easier for people to take advantage of what's out there and gives them the leg up to, to be successful. And it's so important. I do have to add with the mobile market, what's so exciting about that, that's just one step that we're focused on uh, food insecurity. We're partnering with Instacart and we're gonna do an announcement later this month about providing uh, food delivery at no cost to folks in our challenged neighborhoods based on Medicare and Medicaid to start in the beginning and then grow that. But taking advantage of technology out there, we have a banking partner to help folks who may not have a, a bank account so they can set that up at no charge. We have somebody who's gonna provide Kindles if they don't have electronic device that they can do those orders. Then obviously we still have folks who don't like any of that, <laughs> they don't wanna do it by phone, but making sure that people could take advantage because the majority of our city, almost 97% of the city can be delivered to. So let's take advantage of that technology to solve the problem short term. Long term, having the right grocer come in is important, but we have to build up our density in our communities. We have to build up one block at a time, get houses, people living there, because we can't afford to subsidize a grocery store and then it closed again. We've seen it happen in our community before. Spartanburg unfortunately just went through it themselves where they, they just put $900,000 into a grocery store for the second time in an area and it closed within 12 months. Now they're not gonna get another grocery store there. And so that's gonna be a food desert and we don't want that to happen here. So we're being very intentional about how we address issues, but trying to be creative to solve the problem in the short term with the long term. We build up our community slowly. We're gonna get those grocery stores in that neighborhood retail back. We wanna make sure that every corner of our community has every, it shouldn't matter where you drive, you ought to see the same things and we're gonna continue to push that. And we've talked a lot about all these general projects and I know we're gonna to try to leave some time here for some, some questions but we broke it down in economic development, public service, neighborhood, and communities, but there's a fourth piece. So if you look under your chair, there's a little piece uh, of something, if you'll pick it up. You are now part of the puzzle. So we talk about puzzle pieces all the time and why they're important. I carry around a one in my pocket. And the reason I do that is I'm a believer well, I'll put it in the other pocket. I knew I had it. <laughs> but what, why, why being part of the puzzle is so important is, is if you look at a piece of a puzzle, it connects in multiple ways. It touches many different ways. So the fourth piece is you all. So when you leave here, I hope you'll think about how am I going to be part of that puzzle in Columbia? How am I going to touch different people, different places, and how am I going to join in and be part of making our city the number one city there is? Because we can only do so much, and we shouldn't do everything. There are a lot of things we've been doing that we probably should never do, and we probably won't. We're going to stay focused on doing what we do best and how we improve the quality of life based on what our role is. But we need the business community. We need our neighborhoods. 
we need everybody to be part of this puzzle. So I ask you to think about how am I going to be part of the puzzle moving forward and how we, we continue to grow our community. With that, I'll open it up to any questions that somebody may have. Morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Lucinta Lewis Ellis. I own LLE Construction Group here in the city. Absolutely love Columbia. Um, I really just have a comment. Um, OBO, y'all do such an amazing job with small business owners, and I, I commend you as well. I really miss your Facebook page, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> I know, I think about a year ago, you merged with the city Facebook page. And a lot of times, some of the things that you guys put out get kind of lost in the shuffle of everything else going on with the city that it's hard to find what's going on for small business owners. So I just wanted to say it would be nice to go back to having that page because a lot of people use it as a resource to kind of show up for your events. Um, and y'all did such a great job of keeping us informed. So I really miss that. I just wanted to say that. Thank you so Thank much you. for giving the feedback. That's what we need. You know, when we talk about being open for business innovation ideas, but we want to hear that. It's very important for us to hear feedback. And and for us, you know, sometimes people go, well, I don't want to complain. I mean, you're not complaining. You know what you're doing? Because if we don't know it, we can't fix it. Uh, I take every, every complaint as a compliment. And that's the way we have to look at it because you could just go post something on the internet and we'd never see it. But no, you're sharing that with us and so important. Yeah. Yeah. So Mayor Rickman and City Council also have pushed the staff and myself to look at our marketing and communications opportunities. And so we are well underway. We have a consultant that's been working for a few months now with our uh, marketing and communications team, uh, public relations and procurement and economic development. So you heard Ryan mention a pitch book. Um, you've um, heard some of the other things that the mayor said about um, the brand. And so you will be seeing in the very near future some of the results of that. But some of the due diligence has included Lucinta looking at how saturated we've been. Our public relations staff does an amazing job but it's a lot of information. And so there was a request by the council as well to make sure we were coming from one message. We had a brand that people truly recognized. And some of that required us to stop a minute and dial some things back. But you're gonna see the efforts come back. And we have heard loud and clear that the OBO page was <laughs> one that people uh, really followed. And so that, um, that marketing communications um, consultant is well aware of that and council will be getting some inside information that I need to share with them first on the social media audit and some other things coming up in the next few weeks and then we're going to be rolling things out a little bit differently but thank you much appreciated feedback Good morning. I'm Karen Jenkins. I'm also the ch in current chair of the Columbia Chamber. Um, one question later, but I do want to stop and thank the mayor and Ms. Wilson and really this entire staff, because what you guys have accomplished was not easy, especially coming off of the COVID crisis. So I want to acknowledge all of the work and effort that you and your team have put together. When we look at the economic development piece and we're looking at bringing businesses in, one of the challenges of our community is that we have some of the best colleges in the country with some of the best talent graduating, but a lot, almost the majority of those students are leaving. So when we're looking at recruiting businesses and recruiting entertainment and recruiting other things, are we tapping into the college community and finding out what would make them stay here? What would entice them to? What, what other things do we need to bring in? To I need to sure? write you a check right now. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so one of the things we didn't really talk about, and part of our retention program, is exactly that. So a year ago, we started the uh, uh, Council for College in, in Engagement, and so we have members from every college and university here meet in the mayor's office with me and staff to talk about. So what we learned is why are people not staying here? You know, one, they didn't feel connected. Um, 
to be honest, a lot of the students felt like they were being just put in the newspaper for going to five points or wherever. And they're like, what's the difference between us standing in line there and somebody standing in line at Soda City? Maybe 20 years difference in age, but that's it. And so they felt very disconnected. So somebody tweeted out and I chased it and we ended up creating this council. So I have members from Allen Benedict, Columbia College, CIU, Lenore Ryan, Midlands Tech, the University of South Carolina, all of them come every month and meet. So we learned we need more downtown living. We need options that are more young professional with the same amenities that, that some of the student housing has. You know, they wanna live, work, breathe, walk downtown. They're not interested in commuting. They're not interested in buying. And so when they show you the examples that South Charlotte, perfect example, where all that growth is, well Lowe's, the corporation built their back office in the middle of that neighborhood because that's where all the young people were. So doing the same thing, giving those amenities, finishing the greenways and the connectivity, investing in downtown and creating that vibrant is what they're looking for. But the other thing we learned from them is that they didn't, under, they didn't know about all the opportunities that were available here. They didn't know about the internships that certain businesses were putting out. So getting them engaged but cross-pollinating the campuses. So last year, USC had 2,000 tickets left over for their homecoming concert. We got to spread those out to other colleges and universities. So those things doing, we're gonna do another um, side hustle. So we, we, we pay for their business license and we give them a half a block during Soda City where they can, the students who have side businesses can go out there and do it, but it brings the rest of them together. They've come together to help us go after an Apple store. So each college is invested in doing that. They want to, they want to take part in the capture program that was created. So it's, it's a, um, a, a project that allows people to get kind of immersed in Columbia, learn history and everything else. They're dying to be part of it. But what we're creating is a network for them to share information so that you know, if Benedict's having a festival, then they want the USC students to know about it. They want them to come around. If USC's got a, a student art show, they want the other colleges. And everybody's invested in it. We've learned so much from them. And part of it is, is they never felt part of the community. And I think with the scattered downtown living now, um, I, I mean, I gotta throw my, my hand out to Dr. Artis. She's engaging those students to say, if you want to do a graduate program, we got them all right here. You don't have to leave. She's showing them their opportunities right here. And, and I think that's what takes a different. Dr. McNeely is getting ready to do some big investment over at Allen, but they're now engaging in the community. Um, you know, President Smith, you know, had to leave CIU, but the intern president, the new president, they're engaged. We got a new president at Columbia College engaged um, so I think we're in the right path, but that's what we're doing to try to include them in the decision making. I, I think that's great because the other issue is that, you know, as you guys are recruiting businesses here, if the businesses are coming here, but we can't keep employees here, if they can't find employees, qualified candidates are going to stay there, that's going to be a problem. So my second question, and I promise I'll give it the mic, is, you know, we talked about us being a part of, of the equation. So we are, I think this is a small, or the business community. So two questions, how can we as businesses support all of your efforts? And, and because we are a part of the community, so what can we do? And then I also wanna make the comment, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, so you know, there's always the Greenville thing and the Charleston thing, right? And a lot of- We're people, about the Columbia thing, we're, by the Exactly, way. <laughs> we're about the Columbia thing. And people try to compare us, but one of the things I've done through some of the education that, that the city has put out and the chamber has put out is that we're different, right? We're different, so we have to find our secret sauce and we have to share our secret sauce. We can't compete with Greenville. Greenville has to be Greenville. We can't compete with Charleston. They're doing their thing, but we can be ourselves. So when we look at us, like some of the success I think that they have is a lot of public-private partnerships. So what are we doing there? And then not only public-private partnerships, because I know we bring a lot of these big firms in, you know, from out of the state, but we have talent here in Columbia. We have talent here in, in South Carolina that I think can participate in that. So I guess my question is, what can we as a, as a community of businesses do to support the effort? 
So two things. I'd say the first thing is, is part of why we, we're investing in the marketing side is actually showing people who we are. We've never told our story. Uh, one of the things, and, and it goes back to why we took the Facebook page down in the beginning, everything is when people talked about Columbia, there were seven different stories. University had one story. Airport had another story. We had another story. It was confusing. Nobody could, they couldn't decide who we were. And so pushing this effort to market, I think, is going to help us. Um, as we look at those businesses, obviously, we want to grow homegrown business. So, you know, obviously, we're doing internally. I think we actually exceeded our goal for women and minority-owned businesses uh, in the city. We're continuing to grow that, but showing more opportunities on how we can do more business together. But then do the age-old question, which was, what are the gaps? So working with the business community to understand the gap. So if I'm going to recruit a business, what business would complement your business? What would help your business grow here? Because we want them to grow together, you know, and exposing. So we have a business here that's been here since 1972. A lot of people don't know about them. They're getting ready to hire. The reason they're hiring here is because the talent's here. You know, the one thing that we have in the state that nobody else has right now is workforce not only because of our college kids, but seven out of 10 military retirements at Fort Jackson are staying here. And when I heard that number, is, and so we're trying to work with the general, uh, how, do we, how do we celebrate those folks so that we can introduce them to the business community as well? But we're seeing this, this growth coming for every, that's why, that's why Scout is here. That's why all these businesses are looking here because they see the talent not only today, but for the future here more opportunities, more people stay. And that grows the region. And that's why regionally, it is not about territory anymore. It is about us working together. So quarterly, we meet with all the mayors. We get together and we talk about everything from homelessness to business recruitment. That's why every mayor in the region signed on letter support for, for Scout. Same reason when we're going after the, the funding for relocating the railroads to open up our downtown, we had the entire congressional delegation, all our universities and colleges, both House and Senate on board, both Republican and Democrat uh, leadership sign on. Every mayor from East over up signed on on it. Why? Because everybody's starting to understand what's good for the region is good for all of us. And that was what we didn't have before. If you look at the upstate, they come together every time to go after something. You look at the low country, they come together to go after major projects and major employers together. And I think we're there. I think the idea of collaboration has now everybody realizes that's our negative. So if we keep building those partnerships one at a time, the county, I mean, I, I'm, we, we, we talk at least every week. We're talking to our legislature. We're going to Washington, meeting with the counterparts there to say, all right, this is how, we want this. How do we get it? We didn't get our mega grant the first time, but we went and got a decree. So we understand what we, how to go after it the next time. Um, we're not giving up. We're pushing all of that. But the collaboration piece is what people are noticing. I think that's the key. Mayor, and I would add, since Karen asked the question of what can the business community do to support some of the efforts, you know, obviously um, homelessness is not an easy subject. There's not a one size fits all, um, but some of the unfortunate um, side effects of that, this council really has challenged us to be creative and look at doing things differently. So the mayor talked about Rapid Shelter Columbia. I mean, we have hired a whole team um, homeless services team to begin to work from the inside and collaborate with all of our partners. But it is sometimes, um, you know, a little bit disappointing when we hear at council meetings and such, people from the outside coming into our community, um, from other whole states, um, other whole cities coming in to suggest that we are not doing things right or change or putting in a narrative that is just false information. And I do think that the, I would encourage our business community to be a part of understanding. And that's incumbent on us to get the story out there and tell the messages very clearly of what we are doing. But I can assure you that the data will show 
that the Columbia Police Department, our homeless services team, and all of the city staff from a public works perspective even are working together in Parks and Recreation to create compassionate opportunities to deal with that issue. Um, but it's gonna be a bigger discussion that will come. And we also need to be prepared to have it as a community that's trying to find a solution in a very compassionate way. And the mayor is gonna be giving out more information very soon about um, Operation Hope and Order and another um, probably really big potential opportunity for a campus that um, all of us are gonna have to understand it and support it just like years ago when there was an opportunity for the business community to look at and support doing something downtown. As this city's evolved and we've just talked about all the things that everybody wants the city to be, we have to dig deep and have that discussion together about what that now means for our city and for our unsheltered community and our residents and businesses together. Got time for one more and then I'm going to a ribbon cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody, and I've enjoyed everything you've talked about. One of the things that, as you talk about workforce, I want to go back to sustain, how do we sustain that? And, and making that conversation, I guess one of my concerns is the schools, the public schools. What are you all doing to engage the businesses to collaborate with our educational systems so that we can continue to have a sustainable um, workforce? So I just had that conversation. I spoke to the Midlands Business Leadership Group on Thursday and just had that conversation. Uh, how important it is now more than ever. You know, we're, there's a lot of skill training programs that are they're really growing up. We're making advancements there, but we've got to do more at the school level. And so one of the initiatives that we all agreed to go together is to sit down with Richland One and say, how can we help you? How can we provide apprenticeships, internships? How do we expose more young people to the vast difference, you know, because there's a growing population and a growing need for, for our skilled labor. And, you know, I haven't met a broke plumber in my life um, or an electrician or anyone else. And so showing those young people that the opportunities there and a path forward, um, you know, one of the, the programs that we invested is Jobs uh, for America graduate program. So we were able to work with the governor's office to sign up every high school in Columbia. And that's a partnership between the governor's office, Richland One, and the city of Columbia. And that program really targets some of our most challenged kids, 50 to 60 kids per high school. Well, suddenly now we can affect kids and give them a pass so it follows them from uh, freshman year to their freshman year in college, but it opens up those opportunities. You know, making sure that they're getting all the help so that they don't drop out and they know there's a path forward. We got to do that. You know, we, they've got the training center for CDL, the Hayward Center, um, meeting with a group in a couple weeks. They want to build up the barbershop portion. How do we get more kids uh, into that? You know, I didn't know how much hair braiding made until I sat down with some ladies here. But what was great about it, they were telling these young ladies about it. And, and some of the young ladies, like, if I did that two or three times a week, I could pay for my own education. It wouldn't be a burden on my parents. So I think us going in and telling real life stories, sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly about it, you know, you got to think this way, I think is going to be important. And, I, and that's coming. And that's going to be a big key when you ask what you can do. I think that's too. We got to show folks a pathway. And there are pathways. There's a job for everybody today. There are more jobs in Columbia right now than there ever have been. But if you don't know how to ask questions, you know, it's not just about how you present yourself when you go for an interview. It's also asking the questions, well, what are, what, what's my projected pathway? How do I get to a higher position? What insurance do I get? Do I get retirement as part of this? You know, I mean, understanding the right questions to ask, but showing folks the pathway to get there. And I think some of it is we just, we need more hands. We need more hands to help. School can't do it by themselves. Business community can't do it by, and we certainly can't do it by ourselves. So, combination of both of what y'all ask is what we what we need to do as a community. Thank y'all for being here. I appreciate it.